What's going on everyone, Ryan F and Miles here, and this video is about what I consider to be the 10-ish best cards in New Frontiers. Uh, while best is a very subjective term, the general criteria I use to determine the spots in this list is how well a card does its job compared to other similar cards, and also how impactful that thing is to winning games of Force of Will. Additionally, if a card made me think less about how I could fit it into a deck, and more about how I could build a deck around it, and also how worthwhile that would be, uh, that also affected its priority. Uh, so without further ado, our honorable mentions. Because I always feel like number 10 is a much harder spot to fill in than number 1, because it serves as the cutoff for what cards don't actually make the list. In this case, our number 10 entry edged out some pretty notable contenders, the leaders of which for me were a part of True Power, Makage Rea, Peer, the Godspeed Archer, and Arendite, the Nitrogen Blade. A part of True Power was a very powerful card and definitely something to build around, but ultimately feels a, like a weaker version of what some of the higher cards in the list were doing, and it just kind of ended up in certain decks that topped the most recent GP because it also supplemented what was going on there. I believe that was what truly made this card powerful from what we saw at the GP, and it's not just the card itself, uh, but the access to both Mikage Rea and Layla Maiden of the Swamps, which were excellent cards to fill the sacrifice cost, regardless of what resonator you were actually trying to bring out. Mikage Rea, uh, moving on, is a fine card for the cost, but it doesn't really feel like her power is all her own. It's centered on what you can actually send to the graveyard, and honestly, Dark Alice does that job just fine most of the time, with more upside on Dark Alice herself. While the card Mikage Rea is incredibly strong, given the pieces she's allowed to play with, I've never sat across from a player and felt the game end when a Mikage Rea hits the board. Next up, uh, Peer the Godspeed Archer is a card I probably would have put in top 10 before the Grand Prix actually started, but unfortunately, I think the prevalence of Farisha more than anything keeps Peer too easily in check. And finally, while Arendite the Nitrogen Blade is an excellent way to stop some of the most egregious shenanigans in New Frontiers right now, it falls into the very unloved water attribute, and there are often too many ways to bait it out or play around it and go relatively unpunished on top of that. Adding Arendite to your otherwise non-blue deck will often win you as many games as your now, now tarnished stone base will lose you. And with that out of the way, let's move on to number 10, Layla, Maiden of the Swamps. While Makage Rea is arguably a more flexible card than Layla, there is plenty of incentive to build around Layla, and the payoff for her is one of the most powerful effects that a forcible card can have, calling a stone. More often than not, getting a card or effect to resolve does not come down to who has more answers in hand, but who has more mana to cast all of their answers, and ramping as early as turn 1 is the surest way that you'll be able to fight through everything when turn 4 or 5 rolls around. With cards like Dark Alice, Sacrificial Altar, a part of True Power, and End of Friendship solidly finding their way into almost every Darkness deck in some number, there is no shortage of ways to use Lila's effect early and often, setting up for huge future turns. The only card contesting Lila's efficiency in this area is Chant of Tranquility, which typically doesn't start the ramp engine going until turn 3, and doesn't have Layla's upside of bringing the stone in untapped. This efficiency and overall power level is what solidifies Layla's number 10 spot over our honorable mentions, despite the deck building backflips that you have to do to actually utilize her effectively. Number 9 goes to Calico Cat Shikigami, and it's perhaps the existence of this card entirely that even enables Layla to see play because of her basic Darkness Stone restriction. Calico Cat's primary function is to allow black-green decks to have more easy access to white as well, something that is an absolute premium given the lack of, an, of a black-white dual stone and the effectiveness of light cards such as Dark Alice and Kaguya in graveyard-focused black-green decks. If mana fixing was the only function, though, we wouldn't be seeing it on this list, as it, but as it happens, both of the other effects of Calico are extremely important in shaping what the best decks in New Frontiers look like. Calico's ability to manipulate the graveyard for both you and your opponent can be an absolute nightmare to play against, making even a tapped-out player difficult to combo off against if they have a Calico on the field. Additionally, Calico Cat's token on death was once considered mostly irrelevant, perhaps useful in fringe scenarios for setting up haikus or having a blocker, but now with the prevalence of Sacrificial Altar, as well as cards like Part of True Power and End of Friendship that demand sacrifices, the Cat token is seeing the limelight like never before. As probably the single best green one-drop in the game, and relevant in so many ways with three different effects, it should be no surprise to anyone why Calico Cat Shikigami is such high priority and takes number 9 on the list. 
Next up at number 8, we've got Awakening of the Winged Lord, an absolute necessity for Arla decks, while also a surprisingly strong boost in power for Kaguya decks as well. For Arla, this needs no explanation. What makes that deck powerful is seeing as many Regalia and Magna's Angel as possible to remove as many strangers as quickly as they can. Awakening of the Winged Lord very clearly enables this, and it being a sword art definitely helps it find an easy home there. What really pushes this card out of all of Arla's support cards to number 8 on the list is its alternate use in Kaguya decks. Sometimes the best thing you can do to play around a Kaguya is to not play your best card, but something that your opponent would still want to counter so you have your best card for next turn. Sometimes it's just best to wait until you are able to play your best card, but also have a backup like Arendite. And sometimes, such as in the Kaga Ymir, it's just best to do nothing at all and also try to play the game at instant speed. While normally a Kaguya deck would be forced to idly watch green-white mana that was left open go to waste as they see their own untapped step, Awakening of the Winged Lord perfectly fills the window of an uncast Kaguya with outrageous upside. A player that felt safe by not playing into a Kaguya now suddenly may have to deal with a Sigurd and an Altar on the field with a Kaguya still threatening in hand. The first mode of Awakening of the Winged Lord is not irrelevant either. This is the one that untaps flyers. Uh, most notably, Farisha can steal games from outrageously high life totals. And of course, it's not ignorable to remember that infinite haiku is possible because of awakening of the winged lord uh, this card single-handedly upgrades kaguya decks from linear and predictable to flexible and downright oppressive and is perhaps the most important card to a kaguya deck outside of kaguya herself Next up on the list, number 7, Athenia, Deity of Harvest and Corruption, shouldn't surprise anyone that it's on the list, but what may be surprising to some is just how low it is. Uh, while Athenia is so powerful that it's been seeing play even in decks that can't take advantage of its Rune 1 ability, such as Rezard, or in Kakia decks with Alice's Castling that run as few as one black stone in their 10, Athenia is a card that is at its best when in combination with other cards. Even on its own, an 8-8 for 0 mana is nothing to sneeze at, especially given the upside of being uh, able to remove your opponent's grave, um, the powerful effect of, or the powerful card that is Sephiroth, the Brupin of Life, and of course the absolute juggernaut that comes from combining that uh, with the Athenia Sigurd hand loop. While synergies like this exist, it can be difficult to really assess where the power truly lies in a single card. An easy solution to solve this problem is just to remove a card from the equation. If Sigurd or Alter doesn't exist, do we still play Athenia? With Alice's Castling in the format, and it's well suited in Kaguya decks, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but if Athenia doesn't exist, do we still play Sigurd Alter? And I think that answer is just absolutely. Uh, but as the final piece as to which deck is more powerful uh, is a question we have to ask ourselves. A deck with Sigurd and Alter and no Athenia, or a deck with Athenia and no Sigurd and Alter? It's something to think about, especially for cards like Makage Rea uh, that many of you wanted uh, and commented on Facebook you felt should be on this list. But because Athenia would still exist without the combo, um, and because she enables the best possible thing you can be doing in New Frontiers right now, Athenia easily makes a top 10 spot. But it's clear to me that I think Sigurd Altar without Athenia would be better, so Athenia takes number 7 overall. While drawing a handful of cards and discarding your opponent's entire hand is certainly one way to achieve victory, it really is just lining up the nail in the coffin. So the hammer then, so to speak, is number 6 on our list, and that's Perfect Loki. While removal has become more and more efficient with each passing set, finally reaching a premium in Alice Origin 3, where 0 and 1 mana cards like Crystallization and Mona the Dead exist, nothing in the history of Force of Will does the job like Perfect Loki does. There's really not much to talk about here. It's extremely difficult to get access to high stat lines at New Frontier at a cheap enough cost to justify playing them when spot removal in the format is as efficient as the chance that I just mentioned. There's too many cards to even name that allow decks to quickly cycle through and fill up the graveyard, allowing Perfect Loki to easily take down all but the meatiest of boards. Thanks to his natural quick cast and the existence of Sacrificial Altar, he can even stop most resonators from being able to be cast at all on your opponent's turn. Comparing Loki to other board wipes, he comes in at 1 mana more efficient than Odin's Judgment, 2 mana more efficient than Borma, and he has the additional upside of leaving your own board unscathed. He is not a card that you have to build around, but he is one that you can, as evidenced by the top 8 performance of Theum Galvez's Perfect Loki deck at the recent GP. For this, Perfect Loki takes number 6. Uh, Dark Alice comes in at number 5 in my eyes, and I think that this is one that can be confusing because it follows the guidelines I laid out at the beginning of this video in an abstract kind of way. 
Sure, there isn't a Dark Alice deck, so you might not really call it a build-around card. And if it was the most efficient card in its slot, wouldn't Arla decks with their 8 plus white stones be playing literally any copies of it, where they currently play zero, uh, instead of the Kagia decks who only run six white sources? So what's going on here? Well, I think that Dark Alice is the enabler for almost everything that we've seen on this list. Uh, it can be, it can seem hard to justify that when the Layla decks, uh, either Re Rezar Layla deck or a Divinity Layla deck, usually only play the one copy of Dark Alice, but I, I think that single copy does so much more work than can really be seen just by looking at the deck list. The ability to use cards like Part of True Power or March of the Dead while threatening an altar activation into Dark Alice is a losing battle for the opponent trying to counter with a, a Morning Angel or even Athenia. Uh, you spend the mana to beat the true power, and you lose to Dark Alice off of the altar. If you don't do it, the altar is only going to get worse. Uh, more dedicated Kagia decks love having more things to do with unspent Kagia mana at instant speed, as well as extra digging for important cards for any given matchup. While Makage Raya is a nice way to get a Sigurd into the graveyard at instant speed, doing it instead with Dark Alice ensures that the combo you are about to perform is already protected and extremely difficult to deal with. A victory in Force of Will right now is defined by seeing your most powerful cards, whether you need them in your hand or in your graveyard. Dark Alice not only puts you two cards closer to where you need to be, but she puts the right pieces where they need to go, and she protects them while doing it. At one mana, Dark Alice just completely fits the bill for what most of these decks need, and she takes our number five spot. Number four is going to be Power of Immortality, which is where I think I got the most flack on Facebook for people confused, so I'm kind of excited to explain my reasoning here. Even ignoring my list uh, so far and my biases like that come from the cards that I already find powerful, just a cursory glance at the format will tell you that the most powerful things in Force Will right now are effects that happen when cards enter or sometimes leave the battlefield. Uh, a big reason why Arendite didn't make the list is because more often than not, one Arendite just isn't enough to stop a powerful turn. And there are so many effects that Arendite can hit, and Arendite does it in a very inefficient way. The body that you Arendite is still on the board, you're down a card, and you've spent mana to stop the ability. Stopping an enter ability for your one Arendite mana doesn't mean much if they also pay one for Power of Mortality and then sacrifice that Resonator to an altar. And with Power of Mortality, because it's a rune, you know they always have it. It's always in their opening hand. Being able to effectively copy any non-activated ability in the game for one mana is where this card just really abuses the format. Athenia, Kaguya, Sigurd, Perfect Loki. These cards' abilities can be game-ending for only one mana, rather than the two or three that you would normally need to play them in the first place. Enablers are abundant in this format as well for sacrificing to the power of mortality when you've got Altar, Dark Alice, a part of True Power, and End of Friendship that are all finding play across the top eight of the most recent GP. Power of Immortality is only as good as the Resonators in your deck, and right now, that is the best it has been since the card was printed. So with so many powerful Resonators to abuse in the format, and the ability to do so flexibly based on the situation, it is easily the best rune in New Frontiers. Number three, we have Farisha the Virtuous Vampire, which snuck up on some people, but I cannot understate how just incredibly powerful this card is. With Barrier, Flying, and a Self Buff, the card is extremely potent at closing out games, whether running the Rezard package with Death Scythe Abuse, or the Kaguya package with Awakening of the Winged Lord. If that wasn't enough by itself, Farisha also acts as an unkillable machine gun, making quick work of some of the format's most important cards. Pier, the Godspeed Archer on the surface, seemed like a surefire way for Arla decks to handle Altar and sneak up to the top ranks, but Farisha alone made sure that wasn't the case. Calcocat 2 made a strong argument for the graveyard based decks to play as many copies of Dark Alice as they could, but again, Farisha made a statement that that wouldn't be necessary. At a cost of 2, Farisha takes advantage of both Awakening of the Winged Lord and March of the Dead, allowing her to find a spot in any flavor of altar decks, and more often than not, being their primary win condition. As we hopefully see more tournament progress over the coming weeks and months, I would heavily expect Farisha to rise more and more in priority, both in the decks that are built around her, and also in finding answers to deal with her. Number two is Kaguya, Sealed God of the Moon, and as we near the top of the list, I feel like the explanations we need here are going to be less and less. Uh, this card has been at the top of the metagame almost since it was printed, and for very clear reasons. Not letting your opponent play the game as early as turn two is extremely powerful. Putting a 7-7 seven, seven into play while you do it is extremely or powerful -er. While the number one card on this list may be the best card in New Frontiers, I could, I could write up a whole second list of 
top 10 cards in New Frontiers while you already control a Kaguya, and everything will be moved down one slot for Chain of Tranquility to be at the top. It is just patently absurd how much that card can do for one mana, and even if it didn't exist, Kaguya would still be on this list. Kaguya is played in Rezard, a deck that has no white stones and no divinity. I feel like that should say everything it needs to say about how strong Kaguya synergizes with the current card pool, such as Alter. It is tempo efficient, it interacts extremely well with opponents, and is 100% a card that you can build a deck around while also being a card that you don't need to. And of course, finally, we have our number one slot. And because Don't Cheat didn't make top 10, I cheated and put in two cards, uh, Sigurd and Alter. I feel like these cards have to be mentioned in tandem because without each other, while they still exist, they really don't have as powerful a place in the meta. Uh, without Alter, I don't think any deck would be looking at Sigurd. And I think Layla decks specifically would try to play Alter, even if Sigurd didn't exist right now. But it's really hard to imagine it being a full four of, and they would lose the ability to effectively search for Alter with Makage Rea, making the deck less consistent at using it. So with no real way to divorce the two, it's only useful to talk about the impact of Sigurd Alter in the meta by doing so together, and oh man, where do I even begin? Alter has already made a market impact on Force Will over the past year, but as aggressive decks such as Melgus and Prissia slowly creeped into relevance, as well as the ever-present turn 2 Kaguya decks making it difficult to achieve the setup needed for Alter to succeed, Alter hasn't really had home anywhere in the meta since Worlds of 2019. Sigurd, though, is the game changer. Once you see one altar, or one Makage Rea, you have your Sigurd. Once you see Sigurd, you effectively have every altar in your deck at your fingertips, and the whole bucket of shenanigans becomes unleashed. Alter's power lies in the sheer number of options that become available when it's online, many of which are on this list. Athenia to get mana, Perfect Loki to wipe a board, Kagia to counter a spell, Dark Alice to protect your graveyard, even Power of Immortality to copy the ability of something you already have on the field. These cards, however, are not dependent on Alter to be as strong as they are, but Alter offers you the ability to flexibly adapt to the situation to get what you need. With Sigurd, you get to do that consistently, multiple times in a game. And of course, if your opponent ever lets you untap with your board set up, you can use Athenia and Sephiroth to take their hand away, draw as many cards as you need while doing so. In terms of flexibility, it's very reminiscent of Fox or Scheherazade days. You have a number of disgustingly powerful options, you have them available every single turn, and you, need to, and you never need to commit one until your opponent has made a mistake that you can punish. It can be a little complex to play, but it's damn near impossible to play against as well. Sigurd Alter pushes this format to the brink of tier 0, and for that, it easily takes the number 1 slot. And with that, that's going to wrap up the top 10 video. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please let me know if you like this type of content, and I'll try to do some more. Thanks for watching, everyone.